Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. Here we are back again for another Soul Seeker podcast. And as always, we're going to drop in with some breath. So no matter what you're doing, you can always breathe with us, but just be mindful of closing your eyes. Obviously, if you're running, that might not be a good idea. I feel like if I was ever in the past when I was running a lot, closing my eyes, listening to Adya Shanti or something like that, I would have fallen on my face. So definitely don't drive or anything like that. But for my guest, Ryan and myself, we're going to close our eyes i invite you guys to breathe with us and if it feels comfortable to do so just beginning to shut down the eyes shifting from the chaotic and busy outer world and just scanning into our inner world noticing your feet on the floor sitting up a bit straighter as you let the belly expand inhaling through the nose all the way up Sipping in a bit more air at the top, holding the breath here, and dropping the shoulders, exhaling belly to spine, and slowly inhaling up through the nose, letting the belly expand. Sipping in a bit more air at the top, hold the breath here, continuing to hold the breath. And exhaling, letting it go, let it go, let it go. And last one, inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more at the top, sip in a bit more. Hold the breath, apply the, a root lock, rolling up the eyes. And audible sigh. <sighs> Letting the breath return to its natural state and rhythm and just flickering the eyes open. Ryan Pride. So we just met a week ago and here we are on Zoom for a podcast. Shout out to Tim Jackson again, making a great connection and another uh, podcast introduction. Ryan, welcome to the show. How are you feeling in a word or two? I feel beautiful, man. Thank you so much for that breath work. What a what a wonderful way to drop in. You know, so often we don't do that. I imagine because we're nervous about what it might look like. Uh, but it's amazing how in two minutes you can completely change the frequency of the field, right? So mm -hmm. I feel great. I feel, um, ooh, I just feel good. A lot of juice flow in here. We're here. <laughs> It is amazing, right? Like you said, two minutes. You you know about the 90-second rule, right? Uh, tell me more. Dude, it's so interesting because honestly, like I don't remember when I came across the 90-second rule. It had to be maybe a year or two ago. But in all of the spiritual communities I've been in, mindful communities, um, becoming a yoga instructor, becoming a certified breathwork practitioner – I never was taught this or never came up. Now, in 2008, Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor delivered a TED Talk, and it was her TED Talk that actually blew up TED. And that year in 2008, she was named to Time's uh, Most 100 Influential People. And one of the things she said, just like a throwaway 
thing. It wasn't something that really like caught on back in 2008 was the 92nd rule. And that is, she's a neuroanatomist, by the way, she taught us that the 92nd rule is that our body has a 90 second physiological response when we experience an emotion. So this is like the framework of my new book, the breath process being like, to your point, if we just allow ourselves to feel, it's not that scary because when we feel it, it can move through the body. So I just think it's so important to share that. Yeah, no, no. And I think you hit on something really alive for me because um, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is helping men uh, just get emotionally literate. And we're often, uh, as men, we're taught that we can have, you know, two or three emotions, right? We can be mad, we can be happy, we can be horny, but we're not allowed much in between. Um, And as a result, uh, we have a lot of toxic behaviors that exist, right? things that um, we don't like to say as men, we don't like to admit to, right? The whole toxic masculinity thing can make, I think most of us squeamish uh, and hate the word and hate the term. And uh, we feel alienated by it um, or even shamed by it. But the truth is there is a lot of toxic masculinity. And uh, I think the root of it is that we are not taught to feel our feelings uh, or even admit that we have them. We don't have even a vocabulary to describe what feelings we are having. And then just to piggyback off what you just said, the research is pretty clear that if we can actually feel what we're feeling, it really only lasts about 90 seconds. Um, The feeling will move, but we have to allow ourselves to even tap into it. And the really cool thing is, last thing I'll say here, is that it has a lot of information in it. The feelings actually are guides. They're, They're little wisdom keepers. And they can teach us, um, you know, just by dialoguing, learning to dialogue with your feelings. Hey, hey, oh, wow. Let me just hang on a minute. I'm feeling, oh, I'm feeling insecure right now. Like, what is that? Where does that come from? Oh, oh, okay. That's the part of me that grew up ADD and um, always felt uh, as though I wasn't enough uh, or not smart enough. And, oh, that's the part of me that also puffs up and tries, you know, Uh, has imposter syndrome or, oh, that's the part of me that's wanting to be chosen or picked. I'm like, oh, okay. So like, how is that, how is that now wanting me to move in the world? And I can see all of these things that I do as a result of that feeling. But now because I've actually accessed it, I feel it in my body, I can choose a different path. So really the only way that we can actually be awake for our life and, and, and have a life that we are not, hmm. I want to say resentful, that's the wrong word, maybe regretting, um, yeah. is that we were there for it and that we were conscious of it. And the only way we can really be conscious of it to live the, a mindful life and be present for those people that we love and cherish is if we're actually aware of what's going on inside, we're willing to face it. And once we feel our feelings, be able to pivot and make a choice that might be more in alignment with our true north and our highest values. Mm-hmm. I love it. Preach. Yeah. That's all right, like, man. Yeah. I mean, I just laying it down there for a second, but no, thank I you. love it. That's like the whole breath process. Like the end, when you were talking about like, um, choose, like, what are we going to do? Like that's the H in the breath acronym and have habits to integrate. Right. Because if we're going to do the shadow work and we're going to al- alchemize that into something empowering, we can't stop there. What new habits, behaviors, and actions are we going to take? So my, I'm curious because you have a P, PhD in psychology, right? That's right. That's right. So you mentioned the research shows when we're talking about like the importance of feeling and like somatic experience. Is there any specific research that comes to mind? Because I'm always curious at one for myself, but also there's a lot of people that are just so like caught up in like science, you know, it's like, well, what's the research? So I'd love to hear something. Sure. Um, Lynn McTaggart has done some work on this. Um, Ooh, who is, who am I actually really, really wanting to think of Amy Cuddy? Um, um, but no, there's a name escaping me. Uh, um, Candace Pert obviously was the founder of sort of looking at molecules of emotion and how those things actually show up in our lives. Um, but there is a researcher who I actually studied with, um, who does, does, uh, Feldman Barrett, uh, I'm blanking on her first name. Lisa, Lisa Feldman Barrett. Yeah. 
if you want to look up somebody that's just a hero in the emotional literature space, she is um, so amazing because what she is uh, has shown really is that our emotions are, um, oh, they're like gatekeepers of our thinking. So the old sort of mindset the the was that we have a thought and the thought produces an emotion, right? So I don't like that person. So now I'm feeling angry. Um, or, you know, that was the idea, right? That we see the world, the, all of this information comes in, our brains perceive it. We have a thought that's related to that perception and then an emotion responds. And now what we're learning from fields like neurocardiology, for example, the research from heart math is that what actually happens is we perceive the world through our emotions, through our heart, quite literally. And in fact, some of the craziest studies that they've done at HeartMath is where they will show an image and then they will also have an EEG. And so they will they will be me measuring heart rate variability at the same time that they're measuring brainwave changes. And they'll show an image um, that might be a loving image like puppy dogs. It might be a really scary image like, you know, a crazy clown. And they will see which one is moving first. Are the, is the brain wave changing or is the heart rate variability changing? And what they find is that the heart rate variability changes first and then the brain comes online and see, you know, so, so, okay. So what is heart rate variability? Heart rate variability is the average distance between your heartbeats. So it's not pulse rate. It's not how fast your heart is moving or how slow your heart is moving. It's the average distance between those heartbeats. And that can be very symmetrical, right? Like a metronome, or it can be asymmetrical, like a car running out of gas, right? That feeling. Mm. And back in the seventies, when they were first studying heart rate variability, they found that elite athletes had great symmetry between their heartbeats. They had strong heart rate variability. So the assumption was Physical fitness means that you have great uh, heart rate uh, variability. In other words, you have coherence in your system. That means all your homeostatic systems are integrated, aligned, and, and syncopating it in the same rhythm. That's a really good thing for your health. However, the recent research has found that something else impacts heart rate variability, and that is your emotions. So if you're angry, frustrated, resentful, your heart rate variability dips, and it dips very, very quickly. Well, this is a big finding because now what we're seeing is that when, you're, when your heart rate variability changes, um, all of your other homeostatic systems change in response, including your brain waves. This is really important because it means that our emotional regulation is determining brainwave health, the ability to think clearly, concisely, to come up with new ideas, to innovate, um, to, you know, and what you think about what are we paying a CEO for? What are, what are we paying an executive team for? We're not paying them to lift boxes. We're paying them for their brain. And so um, just we wouldn't send somebody into the ring to box on a heavyweight championship without doing any training. You wouldn't say, hey, don't worry about the sit-ups. Like, no need to do front jabs. Like, just like, just don't worry about it. Just go in there fresh. But we send executives into the workplace every day and we say, don't worry about training your mindset. No, no worries about your stress. Just grind and bear it. That's part of work. You know, don't don't breathe like we did when we start this call. That, that, that's frou-frou, woo-woo, you know, hippie bullshit. And yet the science shows that your brain works better um, because you're getting your your whole system online. And it can be as, as, as quick as 90 seconds. It doesn't, heart math research is like a two minute practice to do heart math. It's very, very quick. Um, and, you know, it creates a lot of impact in our world. And, you know, you might have to do it 20 times a day, but it doesn't take a long time. Um, so, yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah. Yeah. No, awesome. That That's, that's a lot there to unpack. So I, I appreciate it. Uh, there's so many different, uh, rabbit holes we could go down and i do want to go back to your intro which we didn't even get to and we will get to but real quick with heart math um could you share that two-minute practice i imagine you know that two-minute sure. practice then. you want to you yeah. want to do it right now yeah yeah that would be awesome yeah it's real simple i mean there's a few different ones depending on the situation my wife sheila actually is an expert in this and she leads heart math all across the country um, she's creating an online program right now so that you could just do it from your home and your car or anywhere you want. 
Um, and that's actually in process right now, but it's a, and she actually teaches classes on it. So um, if you're interested, you can go to SheilaPride.com um, or go to the Moksha group.com and you can, you can see the, the classes she offers, but I'll give you a little sample of it. So it's real simple. What we're going to do is first get into our body. So I'm going to just gonna invite, you can do this eyes open or eyes closed. For me, I tend to be a type of person that needs to go inside. So you're just going to first ground your feet on the floor and you know, lift your spine up nice and tall. And unlike breath work, what we're going to do is just invite in your breathing to be normal. So you're just going to just focus on your breath for a minute. Just feel yourself breathing in and out. But the invitation is going to be to imagine that you're breathing in and out through your heart. And while we know this is not possible physiologically, you're just going to imagine. So just using your imagination to breathe in and out through the heart. Feel the breath come in through the heart and you feel the breath go out through the heart. And now bring in a feeling of something that gives you ease. If it's available to you, maybe something that actually makes you feel grateful. Something that makes you feel warm, positive, just Feel that energy for a minute in your heart. You're going to breathe into that feeling, feeling of warmth and ease. And you breathe out. Breathe in. And you breathe out. Good. Now you're going to rest your feet a little more firmly on the ground, bring a little feeling into your hands, and open your eyes. Simple, super simple, man. It's not complicated. You can do this anywhere, anytime, and you get yourself back online. And the, the research shows that if you practice this, what happens is you get into coherence. And that means that your heart rate uh, symmetry those, those space between the beats actually comes into alignment. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really cool because your heart, we think of it as just this like pumping machine, right? That's all it is. But what people don't pay attention to is electromagnetically, right? Like we're a Wi-Fi signal. Like the old model of thinking of how our nervous system worked was linear. It was like a, a phone. Remember the old corded phones? Mm -hmm. So we thought like you touch a hot stove and it's like a, you know, a signal goes to the brain. The brain's like, oh, that's hot. And it travels back down to the finger. But what we now know is it seems to be operating by Wi-Fi because it's just way too fast. If it was happening just like, you know, nerve signals going up the cords, it wouldn't go as quickly as it does. The whole body is electric and it's responding to our environment very, very quickly because we have Wi-Fi. But the center of that Wi-Fi station is our heart. The heart is electromagnetically way stronger than any other organ in the body. I think it's like 5X like literally the electromagnetic signal that the heart is producing is five times greater than any other organ in the body. Well, that, that has you know significance. And the fact that our brain is listening to the heart, well, what this means is when you have a scary feeling or an insecure feeling or an angry feeling, what happens is your brain uploads all of the files that from all of your experience, from every time you've been angry, scared or resentful. And that's what you think. So in many ways, the, the conductor of the orchestra is the heart. And so if we can get into consistent nervous system regulation, so much more is available for us in our life because we actually will think different thoughts. They'll, we'll, we'll have a wider aperture. Instead of looking down, we look up, we make eye contact, we notice the person that's cleaning the bathroom, we say hello. And so, and these little micro community moments actually make our whole life better. And so it's beautiful practice. I encourage you to do it. I encourage everybody to do it. Good Lord. Yeah. It's so simple. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate you leading us through that on the spot and providing the science and so much. And yeah, you're totally right. I mean, when we feel good, we feel confident and we're making eye contact with other people. I mean, I remember going through like a two week depression not long ago, a few weeks ago. And one day just being at the grocery store, checking out and just 
feeling like a ghost, just not even feeling like I was in my body. And I think we've all um, been there at some point. And some of us might be listening and be like, what are you guys talking about? Like, that's my, my normal state, right? You know, and I kind of call my previous self like that sleeping robot, you know, and a lot of us get that when we're in concrete jungles, just focused on working and doing as opposed to any connection at all of being. So with all of this, I'd love to unpack kind of your journey and what you're up to because you have the moksha, moksha, am I saying that right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a Sanskrit word. Nobody says it right, so don't feel wrong about saying moksha or moksha. It's, it's moksha, right? Like yoke, mm-hmm. moksha. And uh, moksha means to be awake. Um, and oh. that's, that's the simple way of looking at it. It's a bigger meaning. The, the Sanskrit term is actually the moment that you step out of the rebirth cycle. So, and that may be a bit too much for people depending on your religious leaning. But if if you can, the simple excla- exclamation, uh, explanation for us is just to be awake for our lives um, and to be here for it. And so that's why we chose that word. It's a very powerful word. Um, yeah, I'd love to tell you about my journey. But first, I actually kind of want to, is it okay if I take a back seat, a back step? Because you just said yeah. something about being really sad. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, and I just want to say, I'm really glad that you shared that because I feel like there, there isn't enough people speaking about their suffering. We, we suffer in silence and we feel like no one would want to know that information um, and by sharing it, you, you give so many people permission to just say it out loud. And so I just want to applaud you for being healthy. And, and that is actually what health looks like is to be able to say, I'm, I'm really suffering right now. I could use some support. And, you know, we have so many people that actually choose to commit suicide or, um, that don't get help and they suffer, you know, they really suffer and they, they feel like they can't share their pain with anyone. Um, and yet the reality is we, we all would like to help that person carry the burden. You know, one of the things I'm really involved in men's work. And one of the things that I think is fascinating about getting a circle of men together is that when another man shares their pain, we get to take some of that for that man. Um, And you can feel him get lighter and healthier as a result. And so, yeah, we all need to be able, we need to normalize that, you know, we didn't pick a different planet. We picked this one. And Earth is one of the hardest ones. It's just a hard planet. It, you know, we come down here and we're we're in matter. And, you know, we're in the deepest, densest form of matter, and we're out here, you know, shelling it out with the the hippos and the tigers and the mosquitoes. It's not an easy place. And you, you're gonna every person on this planet is gonna experience suffering. We're gonna lose every single being that matters the most to us. It is not easy. And we need each other. And uh, and the, the old model has been like, don't be a whining wussy, right? If I can use that word. Um, and I certainly heard the worst word growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we've, we've, in many ways, we've like had this bifurcation of our actual soul experience where we're not allowed to admit that we're struggling. And, the, and now you have unbelievable, you have social media, which is, telling you that you should be living this epic life all the time. And, you know, now you're not a man unless you're doing morning cold plunges, um, eating raw steak and doing, you know, a hundred pushups and damn it, be happy. But I work with a lot of men and most of them aren't actually happy. Most of them are barely getting by and we need each other. And so, yeah, I just want to, a long way of saying, I thank you for sharing that. And by the way, me too, brother, me too. And, you know, we're all in this dance together and, um, yeah, just trying to find our way, uh, to well-being, to more presence, to more joy. And that's why we do this kind of work. Absolutely. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, man. And so, um, yeah, my journey has been a really interesting one. Um, I suppose it started early in life when I, I grew up in the foothills of Tennessee and, you know, barefoot and, you know, cow tipping. <laughs> that was like the things that you do when you're just a country kid. Uh, my dad died when I was seven years old of a cocaine overdose. And it was, um, uh, I did not know that at the time, but it was, it was one of those, you know, just life experiences that um, broke me, you know, broke me. And I didn't even know I was broken until I got, you know, uh, to be an adult. Um, and I can, I can kind of trace how that's impacted me throughout my whole life. Um, but one of the ways that it impacted me is that I just wanted to go make mama proud. 
You know, I wanted to go be successful. So, you know, I put myself through college and I put myself through graduate school. I waited tables. I hustled my ass off. Um, early in my career, I, I climbed the ladder as fast as I could. Um, I thought money would make me happy because uh, I was a poor kid. And so I went and I made a bunch of money um, and I had super big house and nice car and um, all those things. And I was really unhappy. And, uh, and um, I finally decided in 2012 that it was time for me to do something different with my life um, after going through a divorce and, you know, uh, a midlife crisis um, for a thousand reasons. Um, but for me, it, you know, the, the writing was on the wall. It was time. And um, so I took a, some time to figure out what I needed to do and what would be best for my life. I uh, became a carpenter, <laughs> you know, following in the steps of Jesus um, and uh, also became a yoga teacher along the way. And I was I can't say that I was the best yoga teacher in the world, <laughs> but but I gave it a go. Uh, mostly, I just liked being in the space. Um, and then along that path, I really found myself. I found a joyfulness I hadn't known. I found a quiet that I hadn't known. And I realized something um, very profound for me, which is that work makes us sick, you know, in many ways. Like we we have to we have to muster up a strength that um, is enviable, right? To wake up every day at six in the morning, you know, and, you know, shave and put on clothes that aren't comfortable and to wear shoes that just, we really would rather not be in. We'd rather be in flip-flops most likely. Um, and then to go get in traffic and sit in that traffic for a while. And then to go into a box, really, you know, a concrete box, maybe it's got some windows it's, it's got a food court area that has, you know, chips, some bad coffee. If you're lucky, they have an ice machine. <laughs> and then you've got to make small talk with people that you may or may not like. And, um, and then you've got to pretend to be really, really excited about your job. And then you've got to work really hard and you don't have a lot of rest. Um, and if you're, re if you're lucky, if you're really, really lucky, you've got some homies there, like some sisters and brothers, people that you could call your friend if you weren't at work. Um, and if you're really, really lucky, you've got a boss that isn't, you know, a total asshole and that cares about you as a human being. And if you're really, really lucky, you work for a company that's hopefully doing something great in the world um, and that they see you as a person that is productive and therefore they give you some grace to, you know, ebb and flow with the workday. But that's not the majority, at least the people that I coach. It's not like most people that I coach are just like, they have to take all their inner energy and fortitude just to kind of get up and do that dance every day. And we also have the time ticking, right? Where we have an existential clock. That's like, tick, tick, tick. this is your life. This is your life. It's happening. It's passing you by. And, and, you know, and then if you're a parent, you, you can't necessarily get out of that dance. You've got to feed your kids. You've got lights and cell phone bills. And all of that says, Hey, I've got to keep going. I cannot quit. And that creates a, a certain um, existential angst, doesn't it? Uh, and for a lot of people, I think they suffer in, in silence. Um, so for me, I wanted to make that change. And uh, my wife, Sheila and I, we, um, and Sheila is probably the most amazing healer that you could ever have the pleasure of working with. She is just, she's just phenomenal. And she's phenomenal because she's probably a psychic. I don't know. It's kind of spooky, right? She's got some kind of voodoo skills. She feels people. Um, and I've watched her in a room and she was just a magical, you know, yoga unicorn. And, um, and so when I met her, I said, Hey, we've got to do something together. You are the most talented person I've ever seen. Um, and I have all of this neuroscience in the back of my head. Um, and I feel like we could be like, you know, a dynamite force. And so we, we set about trying to change corporate America and what were our goals? I mean, so on the left-hand side, yeah, we want to make organizations way more successful and it, we want to help organizations execute their strategy. It turns out that executing your strategy is a lot easier when people feel happy and motivated and they're aligned. 
and that most of the waste that happens in a company is all people related. So on the other hand, we get to make people environments really, really good where people have a lot of trust. They like each other as human beings. They can be authentic. They can show up as, at work as their full, messy human self. And they have the tools, dialogue tools, uh, communication tools to be able to work through conflict, give each other feedback so that that difference is allowable. Because I don't, I don't know if you've noticed, but we have a society where difference isn't allowed, right? Like if you're different than me, we cannot be friends. If you're blue and I'm red, if you're elephant and I'm donkey, like conversation over. And that's a real problem when you're trying to create something like we're trying to create, right? The great American experiment, the Republic that is, is one of integration through differences. No matter who you are, no matter what you believe, no matter what your religion is, what color you are, what political party you are, we can still be friends. Um, that's that's the dream. That's why Martin Luther King got on a podium and said, I have a dream. That's what it means. But if we don't have the tools to tolerate difference, then it will never work. And so one of the big things that we teach is how to have dialogue. Like how can you validate another person even if they're different than you? And turns out that single skill will save your marriage as well, right? Like over 50% of couples end up divorcing. Why? What's the number one cited reason by women? He doesn't know how to communicate. He doesn't know how to listen. He doesn't validate me, right? What's the number one reason cited by men? Well, she makes me feel small. She shames me. Well, what is that? That's an easy problem to solve. It's just dialogue based. And so we do a lot of work for now for companies to help them create winning, high performing cultures and, and people environments where people are really connected and engaged. But we also do work with individuals. Uh, we help leaders be better. That's our coaching business. We help couples be better. Um, we have a therapeutic uh, couples coaching process. And I say coaching, not therapy. I probably shouldn't say therapy. Because therapy, in my opinion, um, with couples often doesn't work well. It just creates a triangulated dynamic and both people are trying to win over the therapist and then they end up fighting after the therapy, you know, and they pay all this money to fight more. Uh, and couples coaching is different. It's giving you tools to actually work together as a team. And um, it's very, very effective. Um, highly recommend it if you haven't tried it. So. Yeah. So we've been doing that for the last 13 years. We've worked with companies all over the world. Uh, uh, we've worked um, in every sector you can imagine, small startups, uh, law firms, and all the way to big multinational companies like Driscoll's Berries out in California. Um, and uh, we've worked with Coca-Cola and New Balance. And oh my gosh, we've got this long litany of companies that have made this radical bet to bring in the Moksha Group. Um, because they actually wanted to invest in their people and make the world a better place along with it. And so, yeah, that's how we've gotten our work. And it's all spread through word of mouth and referrals. And so uh, we've been very, very lucky. I haven't had to spend a dime on marketing. It's just all come through people saying, hey, um, you want to create a great team or you want to get uh, some problems solved? You should call on these guys. They're really, really good. And everything that we do is a husband, wife team. It's it We do that purposely. Um, it's kind of a good cop, bad cop thing. Um, mm -hmm. I basically, uh, bring the bad cop energy. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila gets to be the good cop. Nice. Uh, well, thank you very much for explaining it and telling us, giving us a glimpse into your world. And it's really cool that you can be able to go in a corporate setting and then also do that deep work with uh, couples as well. I kind of see myself in you uh, in a few different ways. It's same, I was teaching yoga for a while and uh, I realized when I was teaching yoga, like, uh, oh, the asana isn't really my strong suit, but I really enjoy leading meditation, breath um, work and like saying right. the thing. Things, right. And it's a good like platform and stepping stone that said, um, there's that piece, but then also for me, like the work I do with corporate and then on the other side doing psychedelic integration where it's like, you know, two different worlds when you're talking about working with corporate and those, uh, uh large companies that you're working with. And then, and on the side doing like, uh, coaching for, uh, couples, when it comes to corporate, you're mentioning communication, and I, I couldn't agree more. Could you give us a glimpse into what it looks like when you're working with these businesses and getting in there? Sure. I mean, we have a lot of different things that we do, and we sometimes will be hired for workshops or modules. 
Um, so we do a fair amount of strategic planning, right? Where are you going as a company? Um, what do you need to do um, from an organizational systems and processes and people standpoint to align to get there? But we, I mean, every time that we do our work, whether it's uh, doing strategic planning or we're actually coming in to do like a human performance workshop, we always get to the messiness of people. Um, it's just, it's always there. You have and to, yeah. There's a great book um, called The Living Organization by Norman Wolf. And he he basically explains that if you look at an organization, and I'll use Driscoll's as an example because we've worked with them, um, an organization is impact can basically be measured by activity, right? So this is the first thing. Like, what are people doing every day? How are they spending their time? What are the activities they're engaged in? So that's one piece, right? So imagine act, uh, activity there multiplied by relationships squared. So relationships end up mattering more than the activity. So if we're all on a, a boat and we're rowing and you've got, and I don't like you and you're like, well, you know, F you, I don't like you. I'm rowing the opposite direction, which happens all the time. Um, or we don't share information because we don't like that person, or we don't actually work with that group because they're toxic. Um, all of these relationship issues, they dramatically impact the activities. And all of that impact times relationships are in parentheses to the exponential of context. So it's a little formula. And context matters, right? Driscoll's produces berries. If the weather isn't right, if water is in short supply, um, if if labor isn't available, these things dramatically impact results. If you look at most consulting firms, though, they don't really deal with context because they can't change it. Um, they don't really deal with relationships because that's messy. Humans are messy. We don't want to deal with that. They spend a lot of time focused on the activities, right? So it's like, what performance plans do you have in place? Um, what are your uh, KSIs? Um, what are your uh, what are your KPIs? <laughs> what, what there's a, all the acronyms, right? We go through all the acronyms and we align those. And we make sure that everybody's rowing in the same direction, theoretically. And then the first time that one group doesn't like another, everything goes sideways. And so what we have found is that it's the invisible factors that you don't see that often impact results. It's things like culture, shared agreements, stories, norms. I mean, I've I've seen this so many times. I worked with Barnes Jewish Hospital System and saw them try to put iPads in place, you know, and then nurses didn't really want them because why? They don't even have time to pee. You know, and somebody's tacking out in room 43 and they throw the iPad, you know, millions of dollars spent on a technology. And and then what happens is like the reality of work sets in. And if it doesn't work culturally, it's not it's not going to work. And that's an invisible thing. Nobody can see it. But if you ask the nurses, hey, would would this work? They'd, they'd probably tell you um, I there was a man at, at one of the manufacturing plants I was leading and he cut off his finger with the machine, which was not possible we sent them through two weeks of safety training. What happened? First day he showed up on the job, new employees wearing the name tag. You know, he's got the uniform on. He looks very new and he goes up and Billy Bob's there and Billy Bob's like, oh, look at this new beer. He's going to try to use the safety equipment. Boy, you will never get anything done if you're using that safety equipment. You got a quota, son. Not going to happen. Take that safety equipment off. Let me show you how to do it. And guess what? Two weeks of safety training out the window, right? Didn't matter. We should have never sent him through it because the first day on the job, Billy Bob told him, you don't need it. Don't listen to anything those corporate yo-yos said. And he chops his finger off. So these relationships, they matter. And um, and so the heart of everything that we do at Moksha Group is focused on how do we build relationships? How do we create community at work? How do we align people to get work done? How do we make the work environment better? where leaders are thriving and leaders create a better outcome for all of their people. Leaders that are emotionally intelligent, they're sensitive, they care, they have presence. Um, these are the things, these are the gifts I think that we bring into a company. Um, we usually do that through offsites. That's our best way to do it. Take a team, two days offsite in an awesome location. Hopefully there's a waterfall in the background and we kind of get real like, hey, this is your life. Are you here for it? Do you know what you're trying to create in your company? Do you know what kind of culture you want to have? Are you living it? Are you aware of your shadows? Are you aware of the non-conscious behaviors that you engage in? Is that what you want? 
you know, would you be open to something different? And oh, by the way, while we're doing all that really awesome work, we're also grounding the nervous system the whole time. Like here, learn heart math, learn how to breathe. Here's a movement, you know, that you can do. This is called Qigong. You guys ever heard of Qigong? Right. Ooh, let's take, let's just take five minutes, do this together. How's this feel? Right. Oh, here's a dialogue that we can do and we can teach you. Can you ground your feet? Can you lift your spine a little longer? Breathe into your belly as you're having this conversation. How's that feel? Look in the person's eyes. Speak your truth. Are you noticing any feelings coming up? <laughs> can you be aware of those? So it's like, it's a whole new way to think about how to move and work in the world where you're fully embodied, right? Full body presence, fully embodied, fully real, fully authentic. And the outcomes that you can create from that space are exponential. There, there is absolutely zero comparison to what a leader that is fully there, fully embodied, fully alive can create in comparison to a leader who is just struggling to go through the motions and doesn't quite know what to say. Um, it's just a completely different thing. And, and we have witnessed profound transformation. When we started working with Driscoll's, for example, um, their revenue was at a certain level. I don't want to reveal that on this podcast, but they have tripled their revenue in eight years, um, which is mind blowing, mind blowing. Um, so and going going yeah. back to this example of, um, say, the Billy Bob character <laughs> here. Uh, I'm Poor thinking Billy, Billy Bob. Bob Thornton, right? But I, I appreciate it here. So uh, Billy Bob uh, sitting there encouraging the new employee to not use the safety equipment. Wh how does that change after working with you guys? What is Billy Bob like now with a new employee? Tough. I don't know if I've ever been able to change Billy Bob. <laughs> so maybe I'm a big F on that. Um, but I think what we would do is is first work with leaders right because there are we you know there we model our leaders we we come in and if our leader comes in at 6 a.m we come in at 6 a.m if our leader wears a sweater vest we wear a sweater vest so all of the permissible behaviors come from leadership and that includes by the way if our leader comes in and starts a meeting and says hey hey, hey before we start this meeting let's just all ground our feet everybody lift your spine up long and let's just close our eyes let's just take a breath any stress that you're holding or that you were carrying before this, let's just like let that go for a minute and just, we're just going to breathe. Good. All right, let's start our meeting. Wow, that's a different type of resonance. And so if we can get leaders to be more present, more embodied, and, you know, imagine a leader who actually comes in and says, um, hey, Billy Bob, you're actually out of integrity. You know, your accountability was that you would, you know, help teach new members of our you know, organization the safety protocols. Why didn't you do it? And Billy Bob's, well, I can't get any work done. It doesn't, we move too fast around here for all that, you know? Okay, got it. That's a different problem. I hear you. I hear you. Why don't we get like three people together that you recommend? You go ahead and pick them, Billy Bob. You pick them. We're going to get in a room together and we're actually going to solve this problem. You say that we're not moving fast enough. We're going to figure out how we can move faster, but we're absolutely not going to take the safety equipment off. Okay. That's, that is a, we are not going to do that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand. I shouldn't do it. <laughs> so, okay. Got it. Different, different, different embodied energy, right? From leadership. It's, the model that we that we were given, especially for men, is shut up, bear it, be tough, right? And and the world needs tough men. We we as men in the world, we have to be tough. But we actually divorced our heart from that process. So love is gone. It's just all tough. And so the missing ingredient is firm with compassion. It's um, I'm gonna hold you accountable to your word and I'm gonna love you through it. Right. So it's both. You know, and that energy is extremely powerful. Um, and I think we bring that into organizations. It's just a different model of what integrity looks like, what conscientiousness looks like. And, and I'm curious the love piece because there's certain uh, words or themes that when we bring them into a business setting, they can be like trigger words or taboo. Like, is that a type of concept like talking about? Obviously, the heart is one thing, right? Because there's two different ways we can talk about the heart. One, 
one from more of a metaphysical like heart opening than the other part of like wow my heart is cracking open am, uh, am i having a heart attack or is this my heart opening right okay right. and then the scientific side of like heart math and you know obviously all of that but specifically talking about like love like is that a word that you can use within your uh your business clients i do not use the word love um but i refer to it and i will use it in a coaching conversation for sure but in a group setting i you know it can be too triggering of a word probably to use but it's throughout our whole training and when when people leave our training after two days they're they're looking in each other's eyes soul to soul right. they're hugging with a full hug, right? Not like a, you know, not the hug with the pat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, a, the classic a, pat. Yeah, right. It's a full hug, and it's a three cool. second hug. And so I think there's a lot of love there. And I, I definitely, you know, we work beside these fellow humans so many hours every day. Like the to say that we're not allowed to love them is really quite criminal, you know, in many ways. Uh, because I've definitely loved the people that I've worked with. I have. Uh, Tim Coyle was a guy that I worked with at Real Vision. And man, that dude is like a homie for life. You know, I've had great bosses, Beth Sweetman, uh, Sam Nera. These were female bosses that were incredibly empathetic and involved in my life and helped me figure out, um, you know, my career and, and were amazing mentors to me. And I absolutely love them. And, um, and so, yeah, I think that there's, you know, we, we don't allow ourselves that permission, but, um, it should, it should be there for sure. Yeah. It loves a tricky one. Cause in one certain kind of case, we could say there's different degrees or levels of love, but then as soon as I even like think that what comes through is like, well, what about unconditional love? Right. Yeah, because it, that's, that's really what we're talking about. It here. is unconditional love because the, the cool thing is, is, and people get that confused. Like I think people go to a burning man and right. And you have like weird things that can happen there and then marriages get broken up. It's because it can be quite confusing. And if you've ever sat with a psychedelic, right. And you know, something, especially like MDMA or something that's really heart opening, it can be really confusing because what you actually tap into is agape love is that unconditional love that you're talking about. And that is, that's source energy love, right? Whether, you know, whatever your religious tradition is, whether it's, you know, Yahweh or Allah, it's source energy love. And that love, it pervades all creation and we're all bathed in it, right? And thank God and goddess for that love because it's in everything, at least my opinion, it's in everything. Mm -hmm. It's in every fiber of every blade of grass mm -hmm. and it is available to us and we can tap into that. And there's a tremendous source of power. Um, and, and yes, it can absolutely be there at work, not to be confused with romantic love. Right. So I, I have a lot of love for people in my life, but I don't have romantic love for anyone, but my wife. Right. So my, well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, but that's not, I mean, not to say that there aren't all kinds of alternative arrangements that might work. A hundred percent. Yeah. I have some good friends in that space as well. So, all right. Uh, now that we're on this uh, topic of like what's taboo and what's acceptable, I'm curious, like, what are your, your thoughts and your take on how, let me see how I want to phrase this. Basically, the conversation here to bring to the table is about wellness and mental health as opposed to leadership, because it seems like a lot of times, you know, corporations and businesses want to kind of like check the boxes almost to be trendy or be like, oh, Gallup put put out a new study or the who is talking about this or that, or I saw an article in Forbes about mental health, we should probably do something, you know, but it doesn't feel like there's a lot of life behind that. So what comes up for you in this conversation? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you're hundred percent right. I don't think there's a lot of life behind it because I don't think we actually know what mental health looks like um, and how to create it. So right now in our country, the number one way to fix mental health is to give you a pill. Right. And, and no shame to that, by the way, like if, if many, many people I know are on um, some type of SSRI or or anti-anxiety medicine, you know, it, I think it's kind of a, a symptom of the greater problem of society. So I get it. But, you know, 15 minutes of hard, fun exercise is as effective as any antidepressant on the market. So important to know there are alternatives, right? And they're lifestyle related. You know, your gut health um, is more predictive of your mood state than almost any other factor. And, you know, how many conversations do we have about the microbiome, 
You know, the, the reality is, is if you were eating fermented foods on a regular basis, um, your well-being scores would dramatically increase. Thing, small things like how much do you sit at your office in this position, right? In this position, your vagal nerve is completely collapsed. And when your vagus nerve is collapsed, you're sending a signal to your body that you're in a flight or fight state, that at any minute, somebody's going to throw a spear at the back of your head. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't make sense to your brain, but, but physiologically, you're sending the signal. Like you think about somebody that's confident. They're like way out here. They're open. They're big. They're like, Go ahead and throw your spear. I don't care. But when you're scared, like you see a dog when they're in a fight, what do they do? They they go down when they're losing. And we sit in this very like, very like crunched position and we type, you know, like this all day. And it's just telling our body that we should, we really in a fear response, you know, and these are, these are simple two minute changes to your life. Like, Hey, make sure you move your body every 60 minutes. You know, there's a great research by Tony Schwartz called Manage Energy, Not Time, which basically shows that by taking small breaks throughout the day, you're way more productive. Um, it's understanding your vagus nerve and, you know, not having a prone posture all the time, having a stand up desk from time to time. It's doing things like what you talked about, 90 seconds to breathe, right? Because what is breath? Breath is prana. It's life force energy. It's also telling all of our homeostatic systems to come online. Um, it's being aware of how much sleep you get, what you eat. You know, these are mm -hmm. you know, huge, but probably more important than any of these is your emotional health. And that's the big conversation that nobody wants to have. We don't want to talk about emotions. Like we, you say we're going to get in a circle and we're going to talk about emotions. You will see the majority of men run for the hills and you will see the majority of women arm themselves up because they can't really talk about their real emotions because uh, it's not safe to do so, especially around men um, who they've experienced uh, male gaze, uh, uh, being talking over, mansplained. Um, they've had to be in a protective position energetically their whole life around men. And most men have no clue what it's like to be a woman. Uh, and yet we're all these emotional creatures and emotions are the number one uh, factor in our mental health, right? They drive everything. They drive our thinking. If we can learn emotional coherence, we can change our whole life. Um, and yet at work, when we feel so many emotions, we're not really allowed to talk about it. And so just to pull this home, um, there's a great research uh, that came out of Daniel Goldman. Since I, I think you mentioned something about uh, Gallup earlier, Goldman's mm -hmm attributed a lot to Gallup's research, but one of the things that he, um, he's like the emotional intelligence guru. And he wrote a book called Primal Leadership many, many years ago. And he found that the number one predictor of performance um, on a particular day uh, could be directly correlated with the feeling you have when your boss leaves your office. <laughs> so mm -hmm. anyway, just imagine the scene, you're starting your work day, it's 9 a.m., like you're kind of getting in your jam. Your boss comes in your office and hey, I got to talk to you about X, Y, and Z, you know, and we've got this thing to cover, this thing to cover, and I want to make sure we're aligned on this, and then they leave, okay? So if you experienced a negative resonance, you, what happens is you're just like, fuck this place. <laughs> I hate my boss. I'm not doing anything. You'll get the bare essentials done. However, if your boss comes in and after that conversation, you have a positive resonance, you're way more likely to work hard throughout that day. So your performance is directly proportional to the feeling state you have immediately after an interaction with your boss or coworkers. So it's either a positive resonance or a negative resonance. Wow, that's huge, right? We just like mapped productivity by a feeling state. And so Daniel Goleman has this great quote, I love it. He says that the number one job of a leader is to manage his or her emotions first and to manage the emotions of his or her direct reports. Wow, think about that. How, that. Many, how many people go to MBA school to learn that? Like we go to MBA, it's like learn the seven habits of the, the eight ways. So let, let's let's go back to that real quick because I'm yeah. writing it down. So to the, uh, Daniel Goldman, who's the author of the book you mentioned and he contributes to book. Yeah, Got he's it. a big emotional intelligence guy. He's he actually founded EQ. He was the uh, he was the source of that whole movement. 
it's funny because in a lot of ways like i i'm just working backwards right because like when i was activating guy into spirituality and mindfulness and mental health like just straight to the core of existence and then it's like okay i i gotta catch up on some things i missed <laughs> you know like emotional intelligence obviously f very familiar with it but not uh, i'm familiar with what it is yeah. on a high level yeah. haven't unpacked it that said okay so he said to manage their emotions this is his or her the leader and then after that was it to manage the manage, your, manage your first your own emotions right Be yeah yeah manage your own and then yeah. manage emotions so this is pay the attention to pay attention to would probably be the better word right like if i come in your office or first i gotta check my own emotions am i sad am i happy where am i at kind of get regulated. I come in, I see you're sad. Now, what should I do in this situation? You're sad. Do I dump a bunch of shit on your plate or do I notice it? I say, hey, I notice your energy seems a little low. Do you feel safe talking to me about that? You and know? that's what I was getting to because it to me it's not managing someone else's uh, emotions. It's guiding them and it's allowing them to be led because no one wants to be managed. You know, they may not want to talk about it at all. But you asked, you noticed, you. And what is the feeling that you have when I leave the office? Even if I did have to put fifteen things on your plate, that first check in it sent a very loud and clear signal that I care about you as a human being first that you matter to me, you know? And what does the brain want? Like at its most basic level, at the most basic level, the brain wants to feel safe, right? That's the, that's the reptilian complex. Mm -hmm. The next level is I want to belong, right? So this is all of the midbrain, right? This is all set up around the hippocampus and, and all of that area is set up around tribe. That's when we started tribing together, we needed to have belonging. So I want to feel that I'm belong. That's really important. But then you have the prefrontal cortex that comes on and the prefrontal cortex wants to get things done. And so it wants to know that I can be successful. And so the brain is always looking for, am I safe? Do I belong? And do I matter? Can I be successful? Can I get my things done? Is there something blocking me, thwarting me, getting in the way of my progress? And that, if that happens, then maybe I don't belong <laughs> and maybe mm -hmm. I don't feel safe because my job's on the line. And these things are always like, you're constantly just moving between those three all the time. And the number one job of a manager is to manage those three things, create safety in your direct reports, make sure they feel included and that they belong, no matter who they are, what their political affiliation or religious belief or how they work, that they need to feel included and help them feel successful, help them feel like they matter, help them feel like they can get their stuff done. And I have to thank my wife for that because she's turned me on to that research and she's been talking about it for years. And um, wow, it's the most simple and effective coaching that I could ever give a leader. Just those three things. Amazing. I love that. Thank you for sharing that with us. Well, cool. So when you're working with these uh, corporations, these businesses, how how does this conversation look like are you telling them oh yeah we're going to dive into our emotions like what what are these conversations when you're you're just having those initial conversations not the ones like driscoll's that you've been working uh, with for nearly a decade you know right yeah no i mean i probably have just got myself fired from almost every client gig i could get by even having this conversation right um because it's a scary one but when you work with a business leader, you have to like put yourself in their shoes, right? They don't, they don't care about soft, fluffy, anything because they're, they're at the end of the day, they're beholden to shareholders. They're beholden to results. And, you know, I think about this all the time. Like it, the, one of the beautiful models in yoga is called the koshas. Have you ever heard of the koshas? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the basics of the koshas are, um, it's it's the sheaths of consciousness. That's what you call it. So like in the, the idea is you exist at many different levels. You exist at the physical level, the energetic level, the mental and emotional level, at the ego level. And and the base of the house is the physical level, right? So in other words, if you're if you've got the flu and I came to you and I said, Hey, let's talk about enlightenment, you would have no capacity to have that conversation. Uh, if, if I if you really had to pee right now and I was talking to you, even in this podcast. You know, and you really had, you're starting to pump, right? You had to pee. Like you wouldn't even be able to hear the words coming out of my mouth, right? So the physiological thing wins every time. That's why it's the base of the foundation. This is why like you want to get healthy and well, you start with the body. But the same is true for an organization. What is their version of the body? Well, it's money. 
Like if you can't pay your bills, you don't need to be studying yoga, right? Like you need to figure out a way to pay your bills. And because that will affect every other domain of your life. And if you're an organization and you're hemorrhaging cash, you know, if your shareholders aren't happy, if your customers aren't happy, if you don't have good product market fit, uh, if you if your employees are disengaged, right? This is like the foundation of the house. So we always start there because we recognize that we can't do higher level work until we start at the level that matters most, which is, can I, CEO, execute on my strategy? Am I having issues executing my strategy? What's getting in the way? Why am I having a hard time growing my business the way I want to grow them? What's impacting margin? Where are my hidden costs that are getting in the way? Why can't I attract more customers? What's going on with my marketing? So it's whatever is getting in the way of their strategic execution. So we start there. That's always the conversation. And we can get into a strategic planning conversation from there. What are you trying to do? What are the you know strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats that are getting in the way? So it's like all of this customary stuff that consultants do. But I think what makes Sheila and I different is that we really unpack the people elements that get in the way. Like we really get into those elements and they're always there. Um, I've never worked in an organization that is trying to execute a strategy where people and people alignment, people momentum, uh, people engagement, uh, people conflicts were not some part of the strategic execution puzzle that needed to be unlocked. Um, and you know, the number one way people try to solve that is while we're going to have a great mission, vision, values, it's going to be really excellent. We're going to spend four days on a retreat and we're going to wordsmith it just exactly perfect. We'll put it on our website and everybody will know that we have this great vision, vision, values. But if you ask most employees, it's like, I think there's some research from CLC that says only 35% of employees even know the mission, vision, values of the company. <laughs> you know, most are not connected to it, but what are they connected to? They're connected to the person they work beside, right? Do I have a friend at work? They're connected to their manager. Does that person care about me as a human being? You know, and those, if those two things are aligned, I, in general, am pretty motivated and pretty fired up to be here. And the next thing I need to know is what am I supposed to be doing? So do I have a friend at work? Does my manager care about me as a person? What am I supposed to do? Let's go. Let's, let's go. And so a lot of what we do with once we get into the strategy conversation is we unlock people, we unlock leaders, we fuel people, we really give them the motivation and inspiration they need to be at their best. We also give them something that I think is so different is we give them permission. We give them permission to show up as their full, messy, authentic self. Um, and I think that transforms everything, honestly. If I had to say what our secret sauce is, it's that we give permission to people. Um, when people feel like they can come in and be themselves and that they're supported and that they're included, um, they will stay with you for 20 years. Uh, they will work their hardest for you because they feel like they finally have a home. They feel like they have community. Um, and you know, th isn't that margin, right? Like, isn't that I'm paying an employee the same amount of money that doesn't want to refill the copy machine paper and loves the smell of the coffee when it's burning um, as the person who changes the copy machine paper, refills the coffee and decides to stay a little later to finish the project. Same amount of money paid, totally different outcomes and results. And it's all because of discretionary effort. You know, it's all because I'm willing to do the extra thing because I care and I care because you care. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, it kind of brings it full for it brings it full circle in terms of permission because we started this off talking about men's work and men's groups, and I mean the, the permission is the piece that allows us to let down our mask, which allows us to go from fight or flight to rest and digest, which allows us to feel and to surrender, and then transform it and make positive changes in our life. So I love it, Ryan. I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your formula and. How how you're making an impact in people's lives, not just in the corporate landscape, but you're coaching with couples and transformational coaching as, uh, as well. So thank you so much. I appreciate you coming on the show and we'll have to do this again and talk finances another time because I know that's something we want to get into. Uh, it, the best place for people to find you, it's in the show notes, but just for anyone listening, uh, can yeah. you let them know where to go? The Moksha Group. 
group.com. So it's the, and then M O K S H A group.com. That's our website. Easy place to find me is on LinkedIn, Ryan pride. You can also look up my wife, Sheila pride. Um, either one of us, um, are connected. We co-own the company together. We co-run it together. Um, and, um, yeah, we, we both serve different sort of needs, uh, out there, but, um, for the most part, we're a team in everything we do. And so you can contact either one of us. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ryan. Appreciate you having, I, don't know, I can't speak right now. Like when you were talking earlier about um, the, the hug shoulders and all that, like what was coming up for me is like uh, oh. exactly why, like for podcasts, like the, this is the longest time I'll sit down. I do not do calls over an hour, <laughs> you know, for that reason specifically so thank you so much and we'll see you again thank you sam man and just i want to give my appreciation to you as well you're you're such an incredible guy and um your your work in the world is so needed and thank you so much for leading us in this breath work and um, i think your program um uh, that you introduced me to last time um you know and, and how people can actually move through the breath work process is is so awesome i love it I think it's original and um, I think more people should know about it. So I, I cheer you on. If there's anything I can do to support your amazing work in the world, um, please uh, hit me up. Let me, uh, let me help in any way I can. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ryan. We'll talk All right, soon. Brother. Talk soon.